All right, it's noon here on the East Coast. Hello and welcome. I'm John Bachman. Hi, everybody. I'm Bianca De La Garza. Great to have you in with us today. And of course, uh, it is the news that we are still continuing to react to. Senator Raphael Warnock, the Democrat, winning re-election to the U.S. Senate in Georgia last night, defeating Republican Herschel Walker. And this means that the Democrats now have that 51-seat majority in the 100-seat Senate. Warnock's win also reduces Senator Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema's leverage as the two Democrats have gone against their colleagues, of course, in the past, John. It also means probably a lot of executive orders and uh, really no stopgap, no prevention of Joe Biden's uh, nominees either. Now, after last night's loss, calls are also growing louder for RNC Chairwoman Ronna McDaniel not to seek a fourth term or maybe even be replaced. Outgoing New York Congressman Lee Zeldin says it's time for new leadership. He was considering a run for chair, but this morning he announced it wasn't his time, and he was grateful for the support that he's received thus far. Now, the RNC National Committee woman Harmie Dillon also announced that she would run to be the next chairwoman. She says Republicans are tired of losing. Ronna McDaniel has served in her role since 2017, and she does plan to seek re-election. But during her tenure, the GOP lost control of the House in 2018. They lost the Electoral College in 2020 and the presidency, also the Senate in 2021. And now last night's loss of the Georgia Senate seat. There aren't a lot of victories for McDaniel to hang her hat on. She is in trouble. And if it wasn't for Trump's support, probably she may not have lasted this long. Let's discuss this a little bit further. And joining us right now is former deputy assistant to President Trump, Hogan Gidley. Hogan, good to see you today. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. All right. So we're hearing a lot of names. Um, <clears throat> obviously, some may say the knives are really out for Rana um, after, you know, not producing a signature win. But if not Rana, I mean, who? Uh, Zeldin says he won't do it. Harmeet's name's being tossed around out there. What are your thoughts on this? I'm hearing a lot of things from a lot of people on this one, actually. People are sick of losing. Uh, the Republican Party is trying to find someone who they feel can lead them better than Ronna. Romney McDaniel has done. There are some issues on the ground in a lot of these states, which are rearing their ugly heads in these midterm elections, uh, which were problematic. There were some apparatus uh, failures uh, and, and, quite frankly, some non-existent mechanisms. I think a lot of Republican parties at the local level were concerned about some get out the vote efforts, some ballot harvesting efforts, mm -hmm. some um, uh, mail-in voting efforts that just didn't quite pan out the way they should have. Remember, this all comes on the heels of a 2020 election in which the RNC said it had a, a wave of attorneys ready to fight all these things in elections, and that really didn't pan out either. So a lot of donors are concerned and confused as to where that money went and to why there weren't more successes and why they weren't ready for things. I'm not saying it's all Rana's fault. Um, I know a lot of people try to look for silver bullets after these elections and blame one person or one entity. A lot of factors go into winning and losing elections, don't get me wrong. But people like Harmeet Dillon see there's an opportunity for them. I'm hearing Mercedes Schlapp's name being thrown around as well as someone who could who could lead the RNC into the future. So, look, I, I know that people are, are, are either in one camp or the other trying to get rid of Rana or or hold on to, to that uh, that power structure as is. Uh -huh. Only time will tell. But I know there are some issues over there that people really want addressed. Yeah, Rana or not, I mean, she has been the person in this seat for, I think, the longest time in recent memory. You know, is it time for just some fresh blood in there, some new eyes? Could be. Uh, look, I'm also hearing Reince Priebus's name as someone who could run for that seat again. Remember, he held that position before Rana, and a lot of people are looking to him because of the successes he had as chairman to come back. He knows the he, he knows the RNC. He understands the people on the ground. But from my understanding, Rana really does have a stranglehold on the votes. Remember, you have to get elected to this position. I don't know all the ins and outs of how this actually works. I've been part of the state Republican Party apparatus, uh, being a, an executive director of South Carolina back in 2008. So I know some of it, uh, some of the rules have changed, but you have to get elected to this post. And Ronna's done a good job kind of keeping her votes uh, mm -hmm. in her camp at this point. So in order to defeat her, you're going to have to siphon those votes away. And I don't know that anyone has the power um, or, or the money to do that at this point. Well, we'll keep watching. Yeah. It will be interesting to see. I mean, it's one of those things that's kind of inside baseball, inside D.C., but it does have a it massive is. effect downstream because of the things you talked about mm -hmm. with the get-out-the-vote effort and the in these grassroots campaigns on the state level and local level. Let's move on and talk and about the Twitter. And, and the, donor, the donor class is a little bit concerned, too, because they've been giving millions of dollars to a lot of different entities, and you saw them kind of go shopping in the midterms and not mm -hmm. necessarily 
put all of their resources, all of their funding into the RNC. They were looking for other methods to help uh, move along the cause, and so that could be problematic for her as well. Yeah, that's one of the, that's that's part of the equation that a lot of people don't consider here is the donors have a big role, yes. not just the GOP voters. Uh, this is the grand old party, and it's their party, and they make the rules. Uh, right. Let's talk about the Twitter files. Uh, they are slowly being released. We learned that Elon Musk fired General Counsel James Baker yesterday. He's got quite a resume, a former FBI general counsel. He's the guy who personally signed off on the falsified FISA warrants. We could talk about a lot of things. We could talk about his connections to Clinton uh, friend John Podesta. We could talk about his connections to Michael Sussman, Crossfire Hurricane, uh, Carter Page. We just mentioned the FISA warrants, the Steele dossier, Igor Danchenko. And then, what a list, huh? Yeah, and then at Twitter, <laughs> he wound up at Twitter somehow, he suppressed the Hunter Biden laptop story. I mean, this guy, James Baker, is the deep state personified. We got his web of deceit up here on the screen. I mean. Absolutely, and one of the things that, that got Jimmy B in the end was the fact that he altered some of the documents that we were promised by Elon Musk and uh, the reporter he kind of handpicked to deliver them to the public. The real question is, it's kind of like with the illegal immigration situation, the, the, the gotaways versus the people we know about. I mean, we're talking about five million people when you add them together. With Twitter here, this is just what we know about, that he right. was altering these documents you know, just hours before they were supposed to go out. That's a scary thing. But let's not forget, one of the biggest issues here to me is that the FBI had the Hunter Biden laptop for about a year before it actually broke, meaning they knew this was real. They knew what they had in their grasp. And that's when they started to systematically go out to the media and go out to the Biden folks, mid-level people at Twitter dealing with uh, you know, campaign people directly and, and then eventually the administration people to try and suppress some of this information and get out ahead of something that they knew they had that was real. And one of the bigger issues to me, too, is when I was in the White House, we sure got a lot of calls from a lot of reporters every day mm -hmm. who had sources in these three-letter agencies the that they said, hey, could you verify this? Could you check on these this various is the issues? Guy. Not one single reporter reached out to the FBI to say, hey, is this real? They didn't know, they didn't care, no. or they didn't want it to be true. They knew it was true. And either way, that's it's probably a big because they problem. were talking failure. to Baker. They, that was their source uh, oh, inside the FBI. That, that's what it appears. The other question we have, too, is how many other James Bakers still exist in the federal bureaucracy? Right. Will we ever know? And it's not even related to this, but it came out of the depositions coming from uh, the Eric Schmidt stuff and the Landry stuff, uh, the, the Attorney, General's Attorney General's of Missouri. Fauci and the, and, yeah, it just yeah. so happened that Fauci's daughter worked at right. Twitter, and they communicated on the regular about content. You can't make it up.